and I would just do a proper introduction. Okay. Uh, uh, so Vivian, uh, it's great to be able to sit down with you a bit after a hectic week. Uh, Thanks for having me. Really, really can appreciate the, uh, your support here of some fintech week. Uh, we had quite a quite a lovely time together, and uh, I'm really curious. So let, maybe first for the people that are not so familiar with Air Wallets uh, just yet, could you tell me briefly a bit about uh, Air Wallets uh, sure. and what you do here, especially in Amsterdam? Yeah, definitely. Um, so my name is Vivian. Um, I head up our financial partnerships team in EMEA for Air Wallets, and you know, I'm based here in Amsterdam, originally from Hong Kong, grew up in the US. And, we now have an office here, you know, um, I'll maybe start from the beginning. So we were founded in Australia back in 2015. So the business is about seven years old now. And just a bit of a backstory. So our co-founders actually started a cafe in Melbourne back in 2015. So back then they had to import paper cups and containers and things like that from, from Asia for their business. And they had to use this remittance company to pay their supplier, right? Okay. And they found that they were, yes, exactly. So they found out that they got charged um, over 7% to place this order. Okay. So Jack, our co-founder and CEO at the time, you know, he was working at ANZ, which is one of the, the largest Australian banks, um, building FX products. So naturally he thought, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And that's how the idea of Air Wallets was born. Okay. So fast forward to 2023, we are now 1,400 people around the world in 20 offices, and um, we've actually recently, um, at the end of 22, raised um, our Series E2 round, so $200 million, and kept our valuation at $5.5 million. So, um, That's pretty decent so for these days. Definitely, yeah, especially during a time like this. Um, we're now licensed around 14 countries in the world history. Um, so here in the Netherlands, we have our EMI license for the DMV, similarly, we're in EMI in the UK and we have CME as well. So Air Wallets is a global financial infrastructure company. And our mission is really to empower businesses of all sizes to grow beyond borders. So what that means is, you know, we work with a lot of e-commerce companies, startups that are really global starting day one of their founding. So they've got, you know, customers around the world, they've got partners, suppliers around the world. So they really need a way to simplify all of this. And Airwallex are, what we do is we really abstract the complexity of moving money globally. So if you think about the transaction life cycle, right? From getting money in, so getting paid as a business, um, revenue to treasury management, to paying out to suppliers, we can help businesses manage that in an end-to-end -end model. So that's kind of in a nutshell, yeah. what we do. Um, and I can go into that a little bit more detail. Uh, I can understand that. Yeah. Yeah, so it leads to the complexity of managing multiple currencies, uh, multiple jurisdictions, uh, and indeed making sure you actually get your money yes. where it needs to go. Exactly. Uh, okay. And to answer your question earlier too, about why Amsterdam, right? I think for us it was a fairly easy decision. Um, so the way we think about it is really across three key things. So the first one is, as I said earlier, you know, there's a thriving ecosystem of, of tech companies and especially fintechs, payment companies. So we see that we have a lot of peers that we can you know, collaborate with, learn from, and surely you know, there's competition, there's cooperation, and we just see that there's a lot of activity happening in this ecosystem in general. The second thing is um, we find that the DMV and you know, the regulators being very forward thinking and you know, in choosing where we want to get our license and and you know, really build our sort of European hub. We chose Amsterdam as kind of a very easy choice again for us because of that reason. And finally, I would just say, you know, access to a really great talent as well. You know, we have um, about 40 people here in this office, you know, out of 1,400 globally. So still a smaller team, but we're growing it over the next um, years to come. And we've got, you know, engineers from a lot of different payment companies with deep expertise. So growing from our engineering team, we've got you now finance, legal, regulatory functions that are based here locally. And then in the future, you know, the coming six to 12 months, we're also investing in our commercial activities, so hiring our marketing team, and, you know, sales teams, account management, etc. So yep. really kind of going full speed into this market. Cool. Well, it sounds, sounds like a pretty nice ambition and a nice growth plan. Definitely. I mean, it can also be quite difficult, right? Because there's also a bit of a crunch on talent. Uh, yes. uh, Very competitive. Uh, so it's relatively competitive, uh, but, do, but do you still think it's attractive from an international perspective? If you look at, I think I mean, there's definitely a lot of uh, 
people with payment experience, for example, sure. available in the market. Yeah. Is, that, is that what makes it attractive, or do you see that it's, for example, generally attractive to, or easy to bring people here to actually get them to, to work? Yeah, I think it's both, and I think the answer to the question is, it is so attractive, right, because there's an existing base of talent here, but also I think bringing talents from other European countries who have found that that's also worked quite well for us. So, for example, some of our colleagues actually moved to Amsterdam to work at Airwallets, and to us that's a, that's a really great, you know, kind of show of faith in our company and our growth conditions. And the other side of it is that there's a lot of different language talents in Amsterdam as well. So I think as we look to expand into markets that require more of our local language capabilities and abilities, um, I think that we're able to to hire, for example, you know, French speaking or Spanish speaking um, local locally based Amsterdam talent um, that will help us really yeah. use this as a hub for European expansion. Uh, definitely, it's quite a, quite a diverse uh, international uh, society, yeah. increasingly uh, as well. I've, I've seen yeah. it also develop over the past decades into an increasingly international city. Mm -hmm. More of this melting pot, as you might find also in New York, for example, or That's London, right. uh, from that perspective. Yeah, and I moved from New York, so I think, you know, being in Amsterdam, it's just as co uh, cosmopolitan and metropolitan, if not, if not more. It's just very concentrated and people are closer to each other. And it's, yeah. It's great we, it's still a bit of a village-like feeling, right? I mean, if you get on your bicycle to get to work at the school, that's, yes. I think that's still quite unique, that that, that works Absolutely. so well. Yeah. Uh, and so, but it's really nice. And so, uh, do, do, you, um, uh, do you also basically look at from Amsterdam to further expand across Europe? Uh, and how would you do that, basically? Would you actually yeah. look into setting up local offices across Europe? Or uh, do you see it as, as it's easy to travel a lot of these uh, locations as well from a sales perspective? Yeah, that's a good question. So currently we have three offices in Europe, one in London, one in Amsterdam, and one in Vilnius. I think we've got a pretty good network of, of people, you know, focusing on different activities. Like I said earlier, the Dutch office has primarily been more tech-focused, but I think that's going to evolve over time. In London, that's where we have our, our GM sits in London, so a lot of our leadership is, is out of London, as well as commercial teams, just kind of on the basis of that. Um, talent again and also access to our customers and, and partners and building us you know we also are investing in that office is more of an operational hub for us so in the future i think where are we going to put our fourth office not exactly decided yet but i think you know just based on the three offices that we have we've got pretty good coverage across so i think it's going to be this way in the foreseeable future but you know i think we'll definitely be looking to go into more countries even just service servicing them out of the yeah, exactly. cool Cool. Yeah, I'm really excited to, to, to follow you on your growth path. And uh, I think uh, one of the things I also find interesting, I mean, for example, over the past week, we've dealt with all kinds of different topics from uh, uh, instant payments and faster payments to uh, open finance framework to Dora to embedded finance to whatever. Mm -hmm. Right? So, uh, are any of the topics, what's keeping you busy, basically? So, what, what do you yeah. see that, that's on the roadmap for our wallets to, to really look? and, and yeah, potentially shape your organization as well for the, for the coming year. Yeah, definitely. I can speak from a financial partnerships point of view, which is the team I look after. Yeah. So the first one is, you know, like I said earlier, I manage our global banking relationships. So we work with actually a lot of tier one global banks as well as regional banks. And I would say the first thing um, that we're going to be focused on and we always focus on is how do we continue to optimize and really build resiliency, redundancy in the infrastructure that we have built. And that means having multiple you know, partners, for example, for each payment rail that we support so that you know, we have the redundancy in place. But also, you know, thinking more broadly from an expansion point of view, we want to increase coverage all the time. So coverage could come in the form in more currencies, right? Because when I talk about you know, payouts earlier, we want to, in most cases, support local payment rails so that we don't necessarily have to go through SWIFT, which is more costly, it's slower. So what we try to do is, for example, if we want to enable payouts into an Eastern Europe country like that's not using Euro at the moment, like you know, maybe Polish multi or um, you know, Hungarian currency, etc. So for those expansion and coverage, we want to actually get as close to the direct endpoints as possible, so yeah. we can offer better pricing for our customers. And I think if you look at the currencies and payment rails in, in Europe, there's actually quite a quite a few that you need to really get good coverage and yeah. support from your partners to be able to service. Right. So I think increasing coverage is definitely one. 
And the second bit is, you know, we've traditionally been fully B2B only as a platform, yeah. but we're starting to explore more of a consumer offering. Yeah. Um, that's kind of through our embedded finance product, which means that we're, we're working with a partner yeah. who services consumers rather than having a direct okay. link yeah, yeah, to yeah. serve the B2B consumers. B2B to see more than exactly. direct to Exactly. And we see that a lot of marketplace models actually, you know, have the demand to have more of a consumer offering and that's why we're we're yeah. also exploring and developing a product. To so that's need really sort of the embedded finance proposition where exactly. you need, let's say, the, uh, within the payment you would actually sort of facilitate that on the back end and make life easier across mm -hmm. currencies and across, across jurisdictions. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, really interesting. Yeah, I think that's definitely a lot of things, uh, a lot of developments in that space. So I can imagine that you can expand, uh, expand a lot there. There's no shortage of work to do at their launch. That's, that's for sure. Definitely, especially with these new regulations coming out continuously that yes. also probably keep you busy as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing I just want to pick on is, is uh, you said on the B2B space, uh, you're actually trying to make the life of the CFO basically a lot, a lot easier, right? Yes. Um, uh, and it was also mentioned here before, for example, by Connie, uh, we also mentioned that indeed uh, it's one of the suites where potentially more and more fintech solutions could actually play an important role to make the life of the CFO a lot easier mm -hmm. because, well, especially in, in mid to small size companies, yeah. the work of the CFO is still a big hassle and involves That's a lot right. of Excel uh, mm -hmm. to actually get things done. Uh, is, that, is that sort of a sweet spot for you as well to sort of try to enhance services at that level, uh, especially for yeah. international firms? Yeah, absolutely. So the CFO and the CFO office yeah. more broadly um, is one of our key sort of target audience segments, right? So maybe just to take a step back. So AirWallet has two main sort of product segments. One is the first party proposition, yeah. which is exactly the, the CFO office. You know, we help them with pay in, treasury management, payout, yeah. basically everything under one umbrella. And then the embedded finance, the second pillar, right? So for that one, it's maybe more about building new products. So we tend to work with the more CTOs, CTOs, or even sometimes CEOs um, on the embedded finance side. But absolutely, for the first one, we serve the CFOs and we help make their lives easier. I think um, it is a sweet spot for us because we're driving a lot more automation, right? And when you think about working with a startup or an e-commerce company that's just starting or scaling up, they might not even have a CFO, and if they do, that's that's great because they're on the yeah. trajectory to yeah, yeah, kind of becoming more established. Um, but they're really short on time, and sometimes you know the cost of moving money around is hidden in the form of you know just give you an example, right? If they are selling on an online store, when they receive the revenue back into their bank accounts or you know in our case a multi currency wallet, a lot of times they are being forced to convert back to euro right away. So I'm thinking about an e-commerce merchant who is based in the Netherlands, they're selling to the US, they're selling to Australia, but when they collect the revenue, if they're forced to convert back to Euro right away, there is some cost already lost, but they might not even think about the cost because they just think about, I've got Euros coming in, I'm happy, exactly. business yeah. is growing, and then when I pay my suppliers, maybe my suppliers in China, and I also get customers paying me in China, why am I getting converting, why am I converting it twice, yeah. as opposed to Collecting in, for example, Chinese yuan and paying out in Chinese yuan again. Yeah, so the multi-currency wallet helps them do that. Yeah. So I think when you talk to the CFO, they're always thinking about how do I automate more processes? How do I save costs? How do I save my team's time to do reconciliation, like you said, all the spreadsheets? Yeah. So we try to make that easy for them by having the software, this end-to-end -end platform that they can just hopefully use and scale with us. Yeah, yeah. yeah that sounds great. And so, uh, I think, and uh, I think there's definitely a lot of demand for for, for those uh, for those things. As, as uh, it remains a pretty challenging task to work internationally from that perspective. So I think uh, probably <laughs> good, good, going to do some good business there. Um, one question I have as well is, but uh, generally also in an ecosystem, there's a lot of potential for different kinds of partnerships. Mm -hmm. And you can mention also that you're, on your end, yeah. you could also potentially collaborate on I don't know from onboarding to risk scoring to fraud prevention to cybersecurity. Can you tell us a bit about uh, perhaps uh, what what kind of strategy do you have there? Do you, do you collaborate a lot with uh, different kinds of parties? Yeah. Uh, and how is that organized at the moment? Or is it easy for people to just mm -hmm. approach you? Or do you have a specific reach out you want to do perhaps to specific kinds yeah. of parties that you're always keen to, to, to meet? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, maybe I'll answer your question in, in two parts. So, you know, when it comes to some of the compliance tools and, you know, partners that we can work with, there are plenty of them here in the Netherlands as well. So we're definitely 
always open to having those conversations. Um, but I w what I'll expand on a little bit more is maybe more in my remit, my time at Airwallex has been spent between strategic partnerships, which is more on the commercial side, and financial partnerships. So within strategic partnerships, how we define it is these partners tend to have some sort of technical integration with Airwallex. So just to give you a few examples, we work with Shopify, we're one of the the payment partners that they have in the platform. So we can be one of the payment providers. If you have a Shopify store, you can choose to install yep. the Airwalks plugin. Um, and from a accounting point of view, we also work with platforms like NetSuite, for example, or Zero. Yep. So again, going back to the point of serving the CFO, how can we minimize you know the number of tasks you have to do to reconcile payments? If you connect to our NetSuite um, integration, then it's all seamless, right? We have the pay fees ready, we can do invoicing so if you send an invoice yep. you just attach an airwalks payment you can manage bill payments or invoice payments all seamlessly without thinking about how do those two systems talk to each other yep. right so i think from a strategic partnerships point of view we're always thinking about how do we increase connectivity yep. in the context that makes sense to our customers to drive efficiency yep. and then also you know from a more commercial angle is there's a lot of businesses within within you know, these sub-ecosystems that we find can be really good customers of Airwalls as well. So how do we work together to then serve those joint customers? So I think the, the short answer to that is we're always open to you know talking to more platforms, especially ones that are enabling businesses to go global. I think that's where our sweet spot, sweet spot really is um, to work with those companies. And then just to maybe quickly wrap up the second point with financial partnerships, you know, we're also always um, open to talking to new banking partners. So this could be, you know, any of the Dutch banks like ING, Rebel Bank, et cetera, to, you know, again, work on the infrastructure side of things. We yep. also partner with Visa and MasterCard, both on acquiring and issuing. So there are many, many forms of partnerships. Like, you know, yeah. the word is no, so of course. broad. It's really, it's really broad. Yeah. But yeah, we definitely see our role in the ecosystem to be, you know, long-term, like to have a sustainable business. Like we, we have to be working with partners and to drive growth together. Yeah. Great. Well, I think that's in any case a great forward to to, uh, to also get people as easy as to in any case get in touch with you. And uh, also from that perspective, I'm just really happy to also give you a stage as our wallet here uh, during the Fintech Week. I think it's been really great to collaborate uh, together on this. Yeah, it's been uh, a fantastic week. Thank you. Thank you for organizing and having us. Uh, yeah, so a lot of big thanks. Uh, look forward to do the next one also together with you. So we'll definitely stay in touch. And uh, yeah. good luck on your expansion plans here in Amsterdam. Thanks so much, Don. Thank you.